again, all right? Now, on Sunday evenings, I'm preaching through a series <clears throat> on the subject of eschatology, which means the study of end times events. Now, last week, I preached two sermons, part one and part two, on identifying the, 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 uh, the image of who the great whore is. Who is that great city? And we saw very clearly that every single identifier points us back to the city of Jerusalem every single time. Now, this is going to be relevant in just a minute. I'm going to uh, you know, get into actually what the subject of the sermon is in just a moment. But I want to quickly review all of the information or all of the evidence that points us back to it being the city of Jerusalem. This is all, most of which is found here in Revelation 17, which the purpose of Revelation 17 is said to be where the angel comes and then shows him who the great whore is. Number one is the colors and clothing of the whore are that of Jerusalem of the Old Testament. The colors of the tabernacle and the temple and the colors of the great whore, which is very significant, are only found. Those specific colors are only found in the Old Testament, pointing you to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the only city guilty, the only city guilty of the blood of the apostles and prophets. It says that the great whore had slain the apostles and the prophets. Only Jerusalem could have killed the apostles. Peter, being an apostle, wrote or he, he, he wrote uh, two epistles. And in one of those epistles, he says that he is in Jerusalem. When Jesus Christ said all the apostles will be sent and will die in Jerusalem. And then Peter is told that he would die the death of a martyr. Which makes perfect sense. It would have to be Jerusalem. And then we saw that in the council that took place in Jerusalem, Peter was an elder in Jerusalem. Peter's last mention was being uh, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is given a very intentional title of that great city, which is the clear revelation of the great whore in Revelation 17. When he shows him who the great whore is, he says it's the great city which sitteth upon many waters. In addition to that, we have the contrast in the book of Revelation between the whore and the bride. We saw that the bride was a city. We saw that the whore was a city. The bride was called that great city. The whore was called that great city. Galatians chapter number four makes a, the same contrast referring to them as a her, as a woman. And it says Jerusalem, which now is, which is Jerusalem on the earth. And then Jerusalem, which is above referring to new Jerusalem in the book of, in the book of Revelation. Jerusalem, which now is, is the only city referred to as that great city in all of the book of Revelation besides New Jerusalem, which comes down, which you have the bride and the great whore. The, the judgment of the great whore is the exact wording, the, the specific uh, prophecy that would take place on Jerusalem in the Old Testament in the context of her being referred to as a whore. She has said that she is going to be made naked she is going to be made desolate. They are going to burn her with fire and they are going to eat her flesh. This takes place and occurs and is fulfilled on the city of the great whore, which is prophesied, as I said, of uh, Jerusalem of the Old Testament when it's speaking of her as being a whore. Jerusalem is the only city in the entire Bible called a whore. The only city in the entire Bible that is called a whore. And then we get to the New Testament and we see that the great whore is, you know, Mystery Babylon is referred to as the great whore. The reason why Jerusalem is called a, a, a whore in the Old Testament is because God likens the covenant that the people of Jerusalem or the people of that city made with him as unto a, a marriage covenant. And then when they go and worship other idols, he says that they have committed fornication on him. The great whore is said to have committed fornication. The exact same wording that when God refers to Jerusalem of the Old Testament as being a whore, it's the only city that's called that. Besides that, there are numerous other fulfillments or prophecies of the Old Testament that are prophesied that will come upon Jerusalem that are never recorded coming upon Jerusalem itself, but they're actually recorded of coming upon as when they come upon the great whore. So you see that fulfillment taking place on the great whore in the in the. New Testament. Jerusalem is where the Antichrist reigns. And in the vision, the whore is the city, or a city, and the beast is the Antichrist. And then we see that the whore is riding the beast. See that the whore is in the same location as the beast. And then Mystery Babylon receives all of its resources by the sea. And then Jerusalem receives all of its resources how? 
by the sea. I mean, it's just an overwhelming amount of evidence over and over and over again. And, and the, the case is, is truly closed with who, sl who killed the, the apostles, who right, killed the prophets. Right. It's game over with that. Right. And like I said last week, it eliminates all the other options, and it only leaves you with one. Right. That's it. There's no other option. And it cannot be literal Babylon. There's no possible way it can be literal Babylon. Peter says that he's writing from Babylon. There's no way that it can be literal Babylon unless you believe that Peter for a period... It says, not only does it say he's writing from, from, from Babylon, he says that the church which is in Babylon. So there's a church located there. And where do we see Peter? In the Bible, Jerusalem. Where does Jesus say you know, that, that Peter, which is an apostle, has to die? If he's a martyr. And what does he end up being? A martyr. And where do we see him? Jerusalem. I mean, it, it's case closed, man. It's super, super clear. Now, I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter number 16. 1 Kings chapter number 16. It's just the introduction. It's going to start off slow for a minute. I want to lay a foundation on what I'm going to be speaking about. I want you to go to 1 Kings chapter number 16. 1 Kings chapter number 16. 1 Kings chapter number 16. First Kings chapter 16, look at verse number 29. First Kings 16, 29, the Bible says, And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Amri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Amri, reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Then it says, above all that were before him. Verse 31, And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Now we see here when Ahab is mentioned immediately, it says that he has done more evil or more wickedly than all of the kings that have come before him. I mean, that's a strong statement because there have been some very wicked kings that have come before him. And it says that he had done more, the deeds that he had done were even more unrighteous than that of his ancestors, than that of the kings that had come before him. And there were some very wicked people. But then not only that, it goes on to explain that he took to wife, in verse number 31, it says that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and it says, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Now, the Israelites were given a very particular command, commandment, and that was not to marry heathen women, to not to, to give your wives unto heathen men, and we see the king violating that command, and he's going out, and so what is he doing? He's marrying a heathen woman, and what was the reason why God said, don't marry the heathen? Because they'll, yeah, exactly, they'll cause you to worship the false gods. Now, if you'll notice here, Jezebel, when she's mentioned, it tells you the name of her father. What's strange about this guy's name? It says the, it says the daughter of Ethbaal. Now, who is Baal in the Bible? Satan. Satan. I mean, think about that for a minute. This guy's name is basically Satan. Jezebel, her father's name is the devil, pretty much. Her father's name encapsulates her. When people are worshiping Baal in the Old Testament, they're worshiping Satan or they're worshiping the devil. That's what they're doing. Now, it tells you all the wickedness that he had done, and it says, and it came to, and it came to pass, it talks about him marrying Jezebel. It says, as though that had been a light thing, like that wasn't a big deal, he went and did this. Now, what is it trying to say to you? That this was a major sin that came upon him. This was not something small, that this was a major sin. And it tells you the reason why. And this is, we're going to keep referring back to this. Not this particular verse, but we're going to keep referring back to this idea of what sin, uh, you know, Jezebel particularly caused Ahab to fall into. And that is that he caused him to worship other idols. He caused him to worship Baal. He caused him, she caused him to rear up an altar for Baal. Now, in the Bible, there are oftentimes types. You know, this is, a, you know, there's a study called typology in the Bible. You know, the most famous example of a type in the Bible, uh, you know, is either Jesus and Joseph or Jesus and Noah. I preached a sermon one time about Jonah being a type of Jesus. So you have a real person, you have two real people, but you have a particular person that you're studying, that you're looking at, and a lot of times in the Bible you'll find a type of them in the Old Testament. The Antichrist, you have the type of Nebuchadnezzar being a type of the Antichrist. 
Jesus, you know, you have Jonah being a type of Jesus in the Old Testament. You have Jesus, for example, sleeping on a boat. You have Jonah, this exact same story where he's sleeping on a boat. A storm arises, both scenarios. A man comes and wakes him up in both scenarios. The man's afraid in both scenarios, right? He's brought up. They both end up being a sacrifice, right? The Lord calms the storm in both scenarios. One time it's the Lord in heaven. One time it's the Lord on the ship. Then you have you know, Jonah thrown in to the whale's belly for how long? How long is he in the whale's belly? Three days and three nights. He says while he's in the whale's belly, out of the belly of hell cried I. Where was Jesus? Hell. For how long? Three days and three nights. Was he, so he's not, only there, he's not there forever because after three days and night, three nights, what happened? He resurrected. What happened to Jonah? He resurrected. Jesus went and preached for 40 days. How long did Jonah go and preach? 40 days. See like how amazing? That's not an accident. The Bible is amazing. And you can find types like this that are undeniable. That when you see them, I mean, sometimes people will stretch things. But there are types in the Bible, and these are my favorite types of sermons. These are my favorite types of subjects. Because it really speaks to the divinity in this book. It really speaks that this is not a normal book. Because no man could sit down and do these types of things. I'm going to show you, and there's many other types in the Bible. But I'm going to show you an undeniable, just an amazing type in the Bible. I wanted to conclude the subject of the great whore. I may preach one other one later in a few weeks just on the, the destruction, but I, for now I wanted to conclude this uh, on a type, a clear, undeniable type of the great whore in the Bible with just so many amazing similarities and parallels, and that is of Jezebel. Jezebel, the great whore, is the title of the sermon. Jezebel, the great whore. Now I want you to flip over to 1 Kings chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter number 18. Now, the middle chapter here, because we were in 1 Kings 16, 1 Kings 17 is a very well-known passage because one of the most famous prophets in the Bible makes his appearance and his first mention in 1 Kings 17, and that is Elijah the Tishbite. Elijah the Tishbite is first mentioned in 1 Kings 17. Elijah is the arch nemesis of Jezebel. They are enemies. They are, they are arch enemies. I want to look at something here in 1 Kings chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter number 18. We'll begin reading right there in the beginning of the chapter. 1 Kings chapter number 18, verse number 1. This has to do with Elijah and Jezebel. Look at 1 Kings 18.1. It says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab. So Ahab was the king, right? Make sure you have this scenario down. Ahab was the king, and he married who? Jezebel, that's his wife, right? So he's saying, God, the word of the Lord's coming to Elijah. He's saying, go show yourself to Ahab. Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. Verse 3, and Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. <clears throat> For it was so when Jezebel... Cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Verse 5, And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land, unto all the fountains of waters, and unto all brooks, peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. Now I want to focus there on a statement that it made in verse number 4. It said, For it was so, so during this time... It says, when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave. So what do we see Jezebel doing at this time when Elijah's on this earth? We can see that she's cutting off the prophets. I want you to flip over, keep your hand here, and go over to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter number 9. So who was it in that case that received the blame for cutting off the prophets? Was it Ahab? It was not Ahab. Ahab was the king at that time, but it was specifically Jezebel, it said. Now look at 2 Kings chapter number 9, verse number 7. 2 Kings chapter number 9, verse number 7. It says, And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy servant. Now watch this. That I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. Now watch this again. At the hand of Jezebel. So who is killing the saints at this time? Who are killing the prophets at this time? It's Jezebel specifically. When he, when he references the house of Ahab is going to be punished, he says that the hand that who, of whom is guilty of this, 
The hand is referring to the person that's actually doing the act or the person that's doing this dirty work of killing the prophets is who? Jezebel, right? It's Jezebel. Now, I want, you, I want to compare the actual wording because that's very, very important when you're, when you're comparing Scripture with Scripture. You'll notice that the same phrases or the same wording will be used about a couple of things. And I want you to go over to Revelation chapter number 17. I want you to look at this with Revelation chapter number 17. Revelation chapter number 17. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 17, verse number 6. Maybe, maybe the key identifier, I would say it is the key identifier of who the great whore is, is given in Revelation chapter number 17, verse number 6, the characteristic of the end time city of Mystery Babylon. It says this, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her... I wondered with great admiration. Flip over to chapter number 18 now. I want you to flip over to chapter number 18 and look at verse number 20. It says this, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Now, what was the exact wording? Look back, like I said, keep your hand there. 2 Kings chapter number 9, verse number 7. God says that he's going to smite the house of Ahab... He's going to smite the house of Ahab and kill the house of Ahab or destroy the house of Ahab because the hand of Jezebel was responsible for killing the prophets. But he uses this exact wording. He says that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets. And then he says this, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. Revelation 20 or 18, I'm sorry, verse 20 says, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy, prophet, holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you. On her. Look at Revelation chapter number 18, verse number 24. See this again. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. I want you to flip over to Matthew chapter number 23. Matthew chapter number 23. You'll notice at a lot of these passages that we look to, when we identify or we, we uh, make known this parallel or this type, that it's very important that you understand who the identity of the great whore is in the first place. Because <clears throat> we're going to be referencing passages that are pointing you back to Jerusalem many times. Look at Matthew chapter number 23. I want to look at verse number 35. It says that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar, Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Go over to Luke chapter number 11. Luke chapter number 11. And look at verse number 49. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. So when you go back, you see when he's punishing the great whore of the end, end times, he uses the word avenge, number one. He says that he's going to avenge upon the great whore of the end times. He's going to avenge the blood of the prophets. Then you see a statement where you see Jezebel in the Old Testament, and he says that he's going to smite the house of Ahab, that at her hand he may avenge the blood of the prophets. And we saw that being spoken of in Matthew, and we saw that also being spoken of in the book of Luke. Now, the great whore, go over to Revelation chapter number 12. Now, the great whore of Revelation is a vision. And it's a vision that John sees, and it pictures the city where the beast is located. Now, that's important because is there a literal whore in the New Testament that's persecuting them? In the Old Testament, we see Jezebel, who is a literal person, a woman who is the queen of Israel. And she at her hand, literally, she, the, she is the one doing the work. Who is the one... That is persecuting the saints in the New Testament. Who is the actual person, if you will? It would be Satan. The Antichrist, exactly. It's Satan, right? It would be the devil. Well, look at Revelation chapter number 12. Revelation chapter number 12. We'll look at verse number 1 just to get the context and then we'll skip down. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. This picture's the nation of Israel, the line or the seed, you know, Abraham, and then would come who? Jesus Christ. The promise was given 
to Abraham and to his seed. So that's what this picture is. You know, the 12 children of Israel came from him, the 12 tribes of Israel. It says in verse 2, you'll see, And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be, to be delivered. Verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. Now, when she sees, the, when John sees the image, what does he see exactly? Does he just see the whore by herself? No, he sees the whore, and then what does he see? He sees the whore riding the beast. So notice the persecution that's taking place. We know that that's the city of where it's located, but who's doing it? It would be the beast, right? It would be the beast that's doing it. So it would make perfect sense if we saw symbolism of the beast persecuting the saints, of the beast persecuting the prophets, right? Because that's actually where it's radiating from. That's actually the person that is initiating the persecution. We'll keep reading. It says in verse 4, let's skip to there, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. This is Jesus, of course. And her child was caught up unto God into his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand 203 score days. Does anyone know exactly how long that is? What period of time that is? Because that's going to become relevant in a moment. Three and a half years. So that's three and a half years when it says 1,203 score days. That takes place for three and a half years. That's, that's how long that that is you know, in years if we were to count that. It's three and a half years, okay? Now, what, what's, who is actually, when we look at Revelation 17, during this period of time, who's doing the persecution? I want you to keep this in your mind. The great whore is who it says in Revelation 17. That's the city who's responsible. That's the city of which where the devil is located when he's persecuting the saints. And it's going to take place, this persecution of the prophets is going to take place for how long? Three and a half years, right? Keep reading there. It says in verse number 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. I want you to skip down to verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So we see the devil do, getting ready to start persecuting, verse 3, 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, it says this, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. Now the woman depicts, or the woman is a picture of the true Israel. If we read on here, we see that the woman is actually the one that's being persecuted for the three and a half years. And who is being persecuted, you know, as far as Matthew tells us, Mark, Luke, Matthew 24, who does it say is being persecuted? The saints. the saints, of course, right? So that is who the women, the woman persecutes, which makes perfect sense. We see Jesus being born of the woman, of the seed, Abraham and his seed, which is Israel, right? And then who flees into the wilderness? The woman, which is who? Israel. Speaking of true Israel, of course. Now, the irony is that it's Israel or Jerusalem, which now is, that is persecuting the spiritual Israel. And what does Galatians chapter number 4 tell you? And even now that's taking place, he says. Even at that time, like Hagar and, his, and, and her son was persecuting he which was after the promise. Those which were of the flesh were persecuting those which were of the promise. Even now it is. He writes in Galatians 4. And then we see that taking place again here. But look at verse 14. May, something major I want to point out. It says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place. So notice two times it's mentioned that she goes into the wilderness, right? Two different times it says that she goes into the wilderness, and it says where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now what is that? Time and times and half a time. That's a time, one... Times, that's two, and then a half a time would be the other half of a year, which is exactly what we saw in Revelation chapter number 12, verse 6, 1,203 score days. So this persecution takes place for how long? Three and a half years, right? 1,203 score days. The persecution is coming from the grave whore, and who is she killing? She's killing the prophets. At this time, 
they go into the wilderness, and it says that the, she hath a place prepared for her, and it says this, where she is nourished. Now, what is nourishment? It, food and water, right? That's, that's nourishment. Specifically, would be food and water, or things that you need. That, if you were to be nourished by someone, you would be given food and water. I want you to go back now to, uh, go back to 1 Kings, I believe it is. 1 Kings 18, again, where we were before. 1 Kings 18. First Kings chapter number 18, where we were before. It tells you this in verse number 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Verse 2. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. Now watch this. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. What is bread and water? It's nourishment, right? What would be considered a cave? It would be the wilderness. It would be away from the city. It's out there where animals, where the wild is, right? That's what wilderness means. Notice that during this period of time, while Jezebel is persecuting the prophets, what takes place? Obadiah has a place prepared for them. God uses Obadiah as a place prepared for them, and he takes them out into the wilderness, and he nourishes them. What happens during the time of the three and a half years of the tribulation on this earth? You have the great whore persecuting the saints for how long? Three and a half years, right? And they have a place prepared for them, and they're given nourishment. They're given bread, and they're given water. Now, I want, you to, uh, I want you to go over to James chapter number 5, verse number 17. James chapter number 5, verse number 17. <clears throat> James chapter number 5, verse number 17. So how long, again, were the, are the saints going to be persecuted and are the saints going to be in the wilderness? How long did it say? For three and a half years. Now, during the time where Jezebel was persecuting the saints or the prophets of the Old Testament, while Jezebel of the Old Testament was persecuting the prophets, there was something else that was going on. Does anyone else know? We didn't go to 1 Kings 17. We'll go to it in a moment. But this is the period of time while Elijah is praying, on the earth, was praying for it not to rain upon the earth. He's praying that it would not rain upon the earth. And then he goes during the, the almost where it's to the end, he goes and he faces off with Ahab. I want you to look at James chapter number 5, and look what it says in verse number 17. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. Now watch this. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Sound familiar? A time, a time, and half a time, right? A time, a time, and half a time. You know, and, and then it tells you it's uh, uh, 1,000. How long is it? 100? 1,203 score days, right? 1,203 score days, which adds up exactly to three and a half years. During the, it's the exact same period of time while the great whore is persecuting the prophets that they are led into the wilderness and they have a, pray, a place prepared of God and God nourishes them. Is the exact same amount of time in the Old Testament when Jezebel persecutes the prophets and they are taken into the wilderness for three and a half years, and they are nourished. Now I want you to go back to 1 Kings. One more time, go back to 1 Kings chapter number 17, verse number 1. The Bible says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God, this is 1 Kings 17, verse 1, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain, these years, but according to my word. So we can see that Elijah has the power to stop it from raining during this time. So this is the beginning of those three and a half years that James 5 told us about. Verse 2. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. Now watch this. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. Now look verse 6. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh 
in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So we saw the application of the prophets being hid, right? But then we actually see a very clear, because you say, oh, well, how do you know Obadiah was the one that actually had a place prepared for them? Well, Elijah definitely had a place prepared for him. How long? Three and a half years. He goes into where? The wilderness where no one lives. He lives by a brook and God himself nourishes him. God himself prepared this place and gives him nourishment for three and a half years. Why? Because Jezebel was persecuting him. Because Jezebel was trying to kill him. 1 Kings 19.2 says, Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do so to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them, by tomorrow about this time. This actually happens afterwards, but during that period of time, we saw the statement where she had cut off all the prophets, where she's driving out all the prophets... Why? Because she's trying to force everyone, obviously, to worship Baal. And we see that that takes place, that there's a, uh, you know, there's a face-off that takes place later on in 1 Kings. In, in 1 Kings 18, where they come together because everyone is worshiping Baal, and, and Elijah's trying to call them back to the true God. I want you to go, it gets even more interesting than that with Elijah. Go to Revelation chapter number 11. Revelation chapter number 11, verse number 3. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 11. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 11. Look at verse number 1. We'll, we'll just read verse number 3. Revelation 11 verse 3 says, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. So that's three and a half years again. It says, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. So for three and a half years, God brings down two prophets. Now, almost no serious Bible student would disagree with this. Almost every Bible student would concur that these two prophets are Elijah and Moses. And the only time you ever have anyone disagree with you is when someone says it's Elijah and Enoch. They never say that it's not Elijah. So everyone agrees that this is Elijah and Enoch, and I'll tell you why that this is Elijah and, I'm sorry, Elijah and Moses or Elijah and Enoch, and I'll tell you why they say that. And I personally believe that it's Elijah and Moses. Verse 5 says this, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Look at verse 6. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. We saw that Elijah had a power in 1 Kings 17 that was given him of God, and what was it? That he could shut up the heavens. For how long? Three and a half years. How long are these men prophesying? Three and a half years. And here's the inconsistency. If someone tries to say that it's Enoch, why are they saying that it's Elijah? Because they're looking at the ability that he has, right? Well, what is the other, per the other ability that we know Elijah doesn't have? What is it? To exactly. And who does that? Who's the only person that does that? Moses. So see, a consistent interpretation, if you're going to base it upon what powers that they are given, it would make sense that you would select Elijah because he causes there to be a famine because he has power over it not raining. But then, who's the other, what is the other power that we know Elijah doesn't do? The other power is that he smites the waters and they turn to blood. And who's the only person that does that? No. Notice that Elijah is the only person in the whole Bible that's able to do that. And no, not only is he the only person in the whole Bible that stops it from raining, he's, he obviously he's the only person, but specifically it's for three and a half years. And how long does this man prophesy? For three and a half years. Who was persecuting Elijah during his first time on this earth? Jezebel trying to kill him. You know, now who do we see persecuting him? The great whore. See how it lines up perfectly? Yes. Makes perfect sense? Amen. Look at, uh, let's go to another passage. <clears throat> I want you to go to 2 Kings 9, 16. You say, I'm not going to believe it unless Jezebel is called a whore. We'll go to 2 Kings chapter number 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter number 9. 2 Kings chapter number 9. I want to begin reading verse number 16. This is about, uh, you know, when Jehu, because Jehu is the one that is actually anointed to be king after Ahab. And he is anointed to, to smite the house of Ahab. And when he goes to Jezebel, 
is in verse number 16 when he begins his journey. It says, verse 16, So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there. And Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. And there stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel. And he spied the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take an horseman and send to meet them. And let him say, Is it peace? So there went one on horseback to meet him and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, The messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. Then he sent out a second on horseback, which came to them and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshad, for he driveth furiously. And Joram said, Make ready. And his chariot was made ready. And Joram, king of Israel, so he goes out himself. And Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot. And they went out against Jehu and met him in the portion of Naboth, the Jezreelite, Look what it says in verse 22. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are many. So notice that exact word that he refers to her as, or what she has done at least. He says, The whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel. And it says, And her witchcrafts are many. I want you to turn over. Keep your hand here. Go to Revelation chapter number 18, verse number 23. What is a synonymous word for witchcrafts? Sorceries. Sorceries. Go to Revelation chapter number 18, verse number 23. Speaking of the great whore in the New Testament, Revelation chapter number 18, verse number 23 says this, And the light of, the can of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice, voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. So notice, the great whore is what? Doing sorceries is what the Bible says. And what does is, what is Jezebel do? Witchcrafts. Witchcrafts and sorceries. Now when he says her whoredoms, is he saying that she is literally being a whore? Is there any record of her actually whoring around? There's not, is there? Is there any record of her actually doing sorceries or witchcrafts? There's not, is there? You know what it's referring to is seduction. It's talking about a woman that is a whore is a woman that seduces someone. A woman that is doing sorceries is a woman that is manipulating someone. It, that, that is what a whore does. When you look in the book of Proverbs and you see how, how God warns the young man to stay away from the whore, what is the whore trying to do? She's trying to seduce him. She's trying to be you know, seductive and manipulate him. And that's what sorceries are. It's a means of deception. It's a means of manipulation. That's why in Revelation 18 it says, By thy sorceries, speaking of the great whore, were all nations deceived. So it's a way of which to deceive someone. Now I want you to flip over real quick again. Go to 1 Kings chapter number 21. 1 Kings chapter number 21. Keep your hand there in 2 Kings if you haven't left already. It's very close so you can find it again. But go to 1 Kings chapter number 21. Now who specifically does it say in the New Testament that the great whore deceived? Who were deceived and who did she manipulate into committing fornication? The nations. There's specifically something else though. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. What is the fornication? Idolatry. It's not literal fornication, is it? Right. Look at 1 Kings chapter number 21, verse number 25. 1 Kings chapter number 21, verse number 25, it says, But there was none like Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Now watch this. Whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. Now when it talks about her stirring, up, stirring him up, it's not talking about him committing fornication. Look at the very next passage. And he did very abominably in what? In following idols. So in what, what way did she stir him up? Or in what way did she deceive him? Or, you know, uh, you know uh, if you will, her sorceries that deceived him. Or her, witch, or her witchcrafts which caused him to be deceived. Would be that she stirred him up to worship idols. What does the great whore do? She stirs up kings. What is Ahab? Ahab is a king. So you see the parallels again, where she's stirring up the kings of the earth to commit what? Fornication. To worship idols. Is it literal fornication? No, it's not. That's clear in the book of Revelation. That's what's going on in Jerusalem. It makes sense that 
where the uh, where we know from actually the book of Daniel that when the Antichrist begins reigning in Jerusalem, he sets up the image, which is the abomination that maketh desolate. And it would make sense that the city is the one that is specifically referenced as causing the world to commit idolatry, because where is that main idol set up? In Jerusalem. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? What every time when you see Jezebel being faulted for causing Ahab to do something, what is it? Committing idolatry. Every single time. What is the main thing, the main issue, the main sin, if you will, of the great or in the New Testament? Causing all the nations of the earth to commit idolatry. Which is exactly what, in the context of her being called a whore, Jezebel did. And her witchcrafts. And her witchcrafts is talking about deceiving him. And it says, she stirred him up. That's talking about stirred him up as in manipulating him. Being a whore. Seduced him. Right? Into this. I want you to go over to uh, 2 Kings chapter number 9. 2 Kings chapter number 9, where we were just a moment ago. 2 Kings chapter number 9. So it said her witchcrafts are so many. And then I want you to skip down to verse number 30. We see when he comes to kill her, when she's actually, he's actually approaching her in verse 30, it says, And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out at a window. Now, there's something that's very, very interesting. Very interesting about this, because there's only two times that a woman in the Bible paints her face. Right here? And does anybody know? Because I quoted it last week. Does anyone remember? Because there was a lot of scripture last week. That's understandable. Jeremiah chapter number 4, verse number 30. And when thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou clothest thyself with crimson. What color is crimson? Red. Red or scarlet, right? Though thou clothest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with the ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy face with painting, in vain shalt thou make thyself fair. Thy lovers will despise thee. They will seek thy life. You know who this is speaking to in Jeremiah chapter number 4? Jerusalem. You see why it's important to identify the city of the great whore correctly when studying typology? Because then when you realize that's, that is Jerusalem that it's talking about in being a whore in Revelation chapter number 17, you see this clear picture of Jezebel being the great whore in the Old Testament. She paints her face, and then when God is speaking to the great whore, but in the Old Testament, it's Jerusalem. What is she doing? Painting her face. What does Jezebel do? Paints her face. Clear picture again Amen. of the great whore. So that, that's significant. That's why you have to understand that the mystery Babylon, the great whore, is the city of Jerusalem. Look at 2 Kings chapter number 9, verse number 33. This is very interesting. So let's look at, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's look at verse 32, though. We'll read. No, well, actually, we skip 31 as well. Look at verse 31. And as Jehu entered at the gate, in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace, who slew his master? She's, she's, what she's doing here, if you're not familiar with the context, is. Uh, Zimri killed Amri, and he basically, you know, it was treason, and he took the kingdom from her, and that's what he's saying that Jehu is doing right now. Did Zimri have peace when he came in and slew his master, who was Amri the king? And she said, she's accusing him of coming in and trying to commit treason right now, right? So that's why she makes that statement, and just in case you were wondering, if it seemed out of the ordinary, verse 32, and he lifted up his face to the window and said, who is on my side? Who? And there look out to him two or three eunuchs. Verse 33. And he said, throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And he trod her underfoot. Now, who is the great whore in the New Testament? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Revelation chapter number 11, verse number 1 says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Notice that, that Jerusalem is tread underfoot. How does the great whore die? In the Old Testament, Jezebel, of course. How does Jezebel die? It says she is trodden underfoot. A very specific reference on how she dies. Not only that, who killed her? Who did she die at the hands of who? Of her eunuchs. So these would be people that are considered what? Like on her side. Like it's almost betrayal, right? Revelation chapter number 17, verse number 6, the way that the great whore dies, says, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the, on, upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, 
and burn her with fire. Now, Ezekiel 16.37, which is speaking of this particular prophecy, says this about those kings. Behold, therefore, I will gather all thy lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure, and all them that thou hast loved with all them that thou hast hated, and I will even gather them round about against thee, and will discover thy nakedness unto them, that they may see all thy nakedness. So notice who destroys her. They are kings that were on her side. Or the eunuchs. Were they against her or for her? They were on her side, right? <clears throat> Furthermore, her ultimate destruction of the great whore is recorded in Revelation 18. Revelation 18, 21 says this, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea. Watch this. Saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be what? Thrown down. Be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. 2 Kings chapter number 9 says this again. When he's speaking to the eunuchs, he says, And he said, Throw her down! So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod her underfoot. Clear and just undeniable, very interesting parallels we see here over and over again. Not only that, in the same verse, there's another one. 2 Kings, right there where we're at in chapter 9, look again. Uh, look at verse 34 after what we just read. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink and said, Go see now this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Verse 36, Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. And the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. What's the point? She's not found anymore at all. It actually makes that statement. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her. And then he goes on and says, then the skull. Just little fragments where they can't even tell who it is. Right. Revelation chapter number 18. Turn over we'll read it. Revelation chapter number 18. I thought I had it recorded here. Revelation 18. Oh, it, I, it's the same verse that I read. Revelation 18, 21, go ahead and turn there, says this, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city, Babylon, be thrown down, now watch this, and shall be found no more at all. Amen. The exact same wording. Shall be found, it says, but they found no more of her than the skull. So notice the exact same destruction that came upon Jezebel of the Old Testament is that which came upon the great war there. Amen. This is, again, I want, I want to stress the importance of identifying the great whore of the New Testament correctly when studying typology. I want you to go over to Jeremiah chapter number 7, I believe it is. Jeremiah 7. I believe that's right. Jeremiah chapter number 7. Jeremiah 7, look at verse 32. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they shall bury in Tophet till there be no place. And the carcasses of this people shall be meat for the fowls of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth, and none shall fray them away. Then will I cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness. The voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall be desolate. Who is this fulfilled upon? The great whore, right? In the New Testament. It's prophesied of Jerusalem, but then you see it fulfilled upon the great whore in the New Testament, right? Saying that they're going to be destroyed and they're not going to be found anymore at all, what we just read. If you would have noticed, one of the things that it says about Jezebel is that she's going to be, that her body, just what is left is her, of her, she's going to be basically just, you know, destroyed to the point where she's going to be the dumb of the earth, right? Well, look at chapter 8, verse 1. I want you to spill over to chapter 8, verse 1. At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of his princes and the bones of the priests, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, out of their graves. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of them whom they have loved and whom they have served, and after whom they have sought, and whom they have worshipped, they shall not be gathered, nor buried. Who'd that happen to? Jezebel, right? They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. The exact prophecy upon Jezebel. Not only that, what's going to happen in verse number 33 to Jerusalem? And the carcasses of this people shall be meat for the fowls of the heaven, and look, and for the beasts of the earth. 
What was the reason why there was nothing left of Jezebel? Because she was eaten by the dogs of the earth. When you look at this in Revelation chapter number, this is real cool, uh, chapter number uh, 18 and 19, when that takes place, is right at the same time as the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right? The marriage supper of the Lamb when they come and the dogs eat them. What does Jehu do right before, if you'd have noticed this, he goes out and says barrier. He sits down and he has supper right before that. He sits down and he eats. And he says that, that she's going to be the dung of the earth. And then you see the prophecy that's fulfilled in the New Testament about the great whore. It says that they're going to be the dung of the earth and that the beasts are going to eat their flesh. That's cool. Super cool. I want you to turn. Let's look at another one. Uh, I want you to go to Isaiah chapter number 47. Isaiah chapter number 47. Isaiah chapter number 47. Let me say this before I make this next point. Uh, you may or may not have heard this or known this, but the name Jezebel only appears one time in the Bible. But not only does it only appear one time in the Bible, uh, I, I've looked up Jezebel a little bit, and I've studied history about it, and uh, Jezebel, there's only one mention of, of the name Jezebel in all of history, and it's the Jezebel of the Bible. They actually found what they believed to be the Zidonians, they, they found, they, you know, they went in and they, you know, they dug everything up and they found a lot of pottery and stuff, but they've never seen the name Jezebel used anywhere else except in the Bible. That's the only time that they've, that they've ever seen that name. So they believe that that name was a specific name, you know, given to this daughter, which was the daughter of, you know, uh, Ethbaal, who it was, the king of the Zidonians. So keep that in mind. I want to look at Isaiah 47 here. Look at Isaiah chapter number 47. Look at verse number 8. This is speaking to Babylon in the Old Testament. Babylon in the Old Testament. And we know that there are prophecies of Babylon of the Old Testament that are, have a double application with mystery Babylon of the New Testament. So a double application. You know, there, there are some things that are spoken of of Babylon of the Old Testament. Prophecies that are actually fulfilled upon Babylon of the New Testament. Mystery Babylon, the great horde. This is one of them. Look at Isaiah 47, verse 8. Therefore hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon thee in their perfection. Now watch this. For the multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. Now I want you to go to the New Testament now. I want you to look at, first I want you to look at Revelation 18. I don't have this one written down, but I believe I know where it's at. Revelation 18. You'll see this quoted right here, yeah, Revelation 18 verse 7. How much she hath glorified herself. This is speaking of the great whore. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. Now watch this. This is the quote from the Old Testament. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. So that's a quotation we just read. Everyone notice that? From Isaiah 47 verse 8. But there was another part to it. She, God also said that he is going to kill her children. When she makes that statement... Says, I sit a widow, and, and uh, she says, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Then God says, I'm going to kill her children, right? Well, go to Revelation chapter number 2. So Jezebel is only mentioned one time in the whole Bible, right? Or let me say this, two times in the whole Bible. <laughs> one time in the Old Testament. One person is ever given the name Jezebel. The person of the Old Testament who was the queen at the time when Ahab reigned. His wife. But then there's this random mention of Jezebel in Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2, and it's in verse number 20. It says this, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth, calleth herself a prophetess, to teach, watch this, and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. And then he says this, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now in the Old Testament, what is Jezebel guilty of? Whoredoms 
and sorceries, right? Whoredoms and sorceries is what is spoken of that she's guilty of. Notice the word seduce here. Now, the whoredoms that were committed and the fornication every time when it's talked about in the book of Revelation, is it literal physical fornication? No, it's what? It's worshiping of idols. What did Jezebel of the Old Testament do? Did she just go around committing fornication and being a whore? In that sense, in the literal sense? No, what did she do? She actually got people or seduced people into doing what? Into, into sacrifice unto, unto idols, right? Well, look at verse 21. It says, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now verse 23. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which serves to the reins and the hearts. Who was it of the Old Testament said, I'm going to kill their children with death? It was the Lord, right? And who was he speaking to? Was he speaking to Jezebel? Like a literal Jezebel? Was he speaking of like there's going to be a Jezebel that comes or something? No, it was not. Jezebel was dead at that time. He was, God says, I'm going to kill her children with death in the Old Testament. And it's actually a prophecy of the great whore of the New Testament. When you see this prophecy quoted in the New Testament, the only time when it's quoted is in Revelation 18, where part of it's quoted about the city, that great city, who's causing everyone to do what? By her sorceries. Commit fornication by sacrificing unto idols. Then we see it also quoted, the other half quoted, to Jezebel, right? And it says that she's doing what? She's causing them to commit fornication by sacrificing unto idols. Every warning that's given to all the churches, who are they warning them about? The Jews. When you see actual warnings that are given, what are they about? You know, they're being persecuted by the Jews. They which call themselves Jews and they're not Jews. And then we see a mention here of Jezebel, this random mention where Jezebel is just brought up in Revelation 2. Like, hey, that woman that you're suffering to teach, right? And then he even says, I'm going to throw her into tribulation. And those that commit fornication with her into great tribulation. And who committed fornication with the great whore? Kings of the earth, the people of the earth. And we see Jezebel's name actually brought up in Revelation chapter number 2. Her name actually mentioned, and she's doing the same thing that she was doing of the Old Testament. 1 Kings chapter number 16 verse 31 again says this, And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. You know what Jezebel always did in the Old Testament? You know what her whoredoms and sorceries were? Getting everyone to commit fornication. The Bible is like super amazing. The Bible, is, it, it's amazing. I love the Bible. I'll tell you my favorite subjects in the Bible are when you can see these undeniable parallels repeatedly. Right. And the one time you see the name Jezebel pop up, it just happens to be in the book of Revelation. And then when you study all the characteristics of the grave war of Revelation, you see those exact same things. And all even prophecies that were fulfilled about the way that Jezebel would die upon the great war. You see all of these different prophecies, and then they're prophesied again a second time about Jezebel being the great war. The sorceries, killing the prophets, causing them to commit fornication, being called a whore, right? Her, you know, she's deceiving all the nations. She's actually causing her husband to commit fornication. The way that she dies, she's thrown down. Where's the, how does the great whore die? Thrown down. She's found no more at all. The great whore is found no more at all. How does she die? The bird or the fowls of the flat or the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field eat her flesh. How does Jezebel die? Exact same way. So you see it repeatedly, like all these different parallels stacking one on one on top of another. But you know one thing that's that's important is you have to first identify because some of those some of those parallels were quotes, but they were found by already understanding that Jerusalem is the great whore. But they were exact quotes to the New Testament about how the great whore would be destroyed. And then you see actually Jezebel herself being destroyed in the same manner. Jezebel is, you know, persecuting the saints for how long? Three and a half years. Right? In the Old Testament. What happens to the saints at that time? They're taken to the wilderness. For three and a half years, they have the place prepared of God. What happens in the, in the New Testament with, with the great whore? She persecutes the saints for how long? Three and a half years. 
And what happens? The saints are taken into the wilderness. They have a place prepared for them of God. Who shows up? Elijah. And, it, and it's interesting because Elijah doesn't die at the hands of Jezebel. The hand of Jezebel, when he lives on this earth, he goes to heaven, right? But you know what happens in Revelation 11? Jezebel actually kills him. The great whore actually ends up killing Elijah, but then what takes place? He's, he, it says that the Spirit of God enters into them again, and they ascend into heaven. The parallels are undeniable, and they're amazing. When you can see all these things, you know, just falling, the same exact wording repeatedly about how she killed the prophets, and then not only how she killed the prophets, how she's thrown down. And, you, and then you can see the prophecies. It's amazing. The Bible is amazing. These Amen. types of things should just cause you to just study your Bible. Amen. Study your Bible. Just one thing upon another. Like I said, I think this was just last week. No man could write a book like this. Right. And then just coincidentally, you see all these parallels with this random woman. I'll tell you my own, I'll end on this, my own just personal opinion about this. I think and I believe just from reading the Bible, just seeing on how God does things and how God gives visions and how he operates, just my personal opinion I believe when John looked at that vision, because he saw something actually and then wrote it down, I believe that it would make perfect sense that it was just the vision, of course, but it, that it was the woman who lived before. It was the woman of Jezebel, because that is who pictured all of these things of the Old Testament. She was a great picture of that. Every single prophecy fell into place, and then her name is brought up specifically the one time. And she's never mentioned in history, but the Revelation too, hey... You know, that woman Jezebel you're suffering to, to teach. And then you go and you see the great whore is, is presented. John wouldn't have been able to tell who she was. He didn't live when she lived, right, at that time. But it would make sense when you see all these parallels that it's actually Jezebel riding that great whore. It's just a vision of Jezebel. Or riding that beast. Jezebel riding that great whore. Jezebel, the great whore, riding the beast. So you see this, and it's just amazing. The Bible is so amazing. And I love the typology, and this, these types of sermons and things like this should just push you to just study and read your Bible more and look for things like this. Look for types in your Bible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord God, for, uh, for your word. We thank you for how amazing it is, dear Lord, and all the different things that can be found and learned. Uh, from your word, we ask you that you'd open our eyes and just teach us so much more, dear Lord. Help us not to be satisfied with the knowledge that we have right now, but to endeavor to learn more and to grow in knowledge, dear Lord, and to uh, love your word more and more. And we just thank you for all the truths that we know thus far. Thus far, We ask you that you would just continually bless our church and bless all the families that are in attendance today. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.